Hey, it's good to be here. Good to see everyone. Um, what a joy to be back and visit with you. Um, some of you might have been wondering, where have you been the last three years? So I'll just give you a quick update. Um, I, I left here three years ago to be interim pastor up at Hope Christian Church and uh, help them out. And then through a series of events, we stayed on continuing to help them. And, uh, and just recently, um, and many of you know this because you've got the news from what's happening up the way there, that church has turned a, a major corner. It's, uh, it's shut down, and right now it is in what I would call a dormant stage where it is retooling for the next uh, se uh, season. And uh, as a result, Andrew Gross, whom many of you know, is uh, leading this series of Bible studies and, and behind-the-scenes kind of efforts so that we're looking at, at uh, restarting uh, with a whole new DNA and a whole new vision. And so that's coming up in a number of months. We're not exactly sure, but that's what's going on right now. And in fact, Sharon, uh, my wife, would have loved to be here today, but we're, we're a one-car family, and uh, she has to get home before I get there because we host uh, on Sundays a dinner and a, the Bible study that used to be Hope Christian Church is now in our home on Sunday afternoons. So it's, it's an adventure all the way around. But at, at any rate, that's kind of what we've been up to the, the last little while. Um, so, Pastor Steve left Minnesota just in the nick of time. <laughs> Am I right? I don't know what the temperature is in Zanzibar right now, but uh, I'm here, you're here in Minnesota, in the cold, and I'm feeling really good today. You know why? Because I can predict without any hesitation, with absolute certainty, that the Minnesota Vikings are not going to lose this afternoon. Right? Now, I can't be quite so sure about the Green Bay Packers. If there are any Packer fans here, <laughs> we'll see what happens. We'll see about that. Uh, anyway, so I've got up here way more technological tools than I need. I've got a phone I'm going to put over here. I've got a speaker, which is working so far. Got an old school Bible just in case I need to look up something. And then I've got this thing. So let me, is it on? Let me try this. It's working. Okay, so we're good so far. So um, it was a while back, last year, several months ago, I read a news item in the St. Paul Pioneer Press. Let me just read it to you. A 48-year-old Excelsior man shot his hunting partner on Wednesday afternoon south of Stillwater, officials said. Washington County Sheriff's deputies and paramedics responded to the scene and took the wounded man, a 54-year-old from Arden Hills, to Regions Hospital in St. Paul, where he was treated for non-life-threatening injuries. A shooter, a 48-year-old Excelsior man, explained to investigators that he fired the shot after mistaking his hunting partner for a turkey. <laughs> this was in the newspaper. Any of you see that? Now I ask you, which would be worse, being shot by your hunting partner or having your hunting partner mistake you for a turkey? I mean, neither one is, is good. And it just made me, it reminded me that sometimes we kind of feel like a turkey. I don't know about you, but there are times when I just feel stuck. Stuck on the ground, unable to take off, unable to, to do what I really want to do. We, we, we would like to feel like an eagle, you know, ready to soar over the mountaintops, have the, the broad view looking down the horizon and, and all of that. But so often we just kind of feel like we're like a turkey, you know, running and hiding in the ditches, you know, hoping to avoid someone's Thanksgiving dinner table or whatever it might be. Isaiah said, those who hope 
or waiting the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like, like, like what, turkeys? Like eagles. Now today is the second Sunday of 2024, and, and there's only 50 more left in this year. So i got to ask you, how are you feeling about the year so far? How's it working out? Are you facing the year more like an eagle or like a turkey? Are you confident about what's coming? Or um, do you know which way to go? These are just some of the questions that I kind of ask. I think we all do it kind of at the beginning of the year. It's a turning point. It's a new start, new opportunities. Famous uh, New York catcher, Yogi Bear, once said, the future ain't what it used to be. Think about it. <laughs> of course that's true. And I think sometimes we face the future more like, like uh, unconfident turkeys than we would eagles who know what they're doing, where they're going. So the question I have for you today is, are you positive or pessimistic about this coming year? I think, of course, it's better to be positive than negative. Some people, though, are, are ridiculously positive. You ever meet those kind of people? I mean, it's like they don't live in the real world, certainly not in the world that I live in. They're so positive, they're even, they're even excited for 2024 elections. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? They believe government can actually solve our problems. And, in fact, they believe, get this, they even think that politicians can act like grown-ups. <laughs> so I'm not that positive. And don't get me wrong, I, as I said, I'm all in favor of thinking positively, having faith, trusting God, believing. One of my favorite verses is from Proverbs 4.23, and this is not our text today, but let's throw it up there. Proverbs 4.23 from the Good News Translation says, Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. I really believe that. How we think, how we trust God, how we go forward in life will shape, our thoughts will shape our life. So, there's an old story about um, a Chinese farmer whose horse ran away. See, before I tell you the story, let me just say this. It takes more than positive thinking to get positive results. Okay? Way more. So I'll, I'll tell this story that kind of illustrates that. This Chinese farmer whose horse ran away, and that evening all of his friends gathered around to commiserate with him, and they, they said, Oh, we're so sorry to hear about your horse that's run away. This is most unfortunate. And the farmer shrugged and he said, eh, Maybe. Well, the next day, the horse came back, bringing seven wild horses with it. And in the evening, everybody came back and they said, Oh, isn't that lucky? Now you've got eight horses. What a great turn of events. And again, the farmer said, Maybe. The following day, the farmer's son tried to break one of the horses, but he was thrown off and broke his leg. And the neighbors stopped by. <laughs> And they said, oh no, that's too bad. How unlucky that your son broke his leg. And the farmer said, maybe. Well, the next day, army officers arrived in the village to draft young men into the army, but they couldn't conscript his son because he had a broken leg. And again, all the neighbors came around and they said, isn't that great? <laughs> your son didn't have to join the army. He had a broken leg. And the farmer said, maybe. So the very next, I don't even have to tell you, the story just keeps going and going, right? That's the way it is. The story never ends. Some things that seem good might not be good. They're not necessarily good. Or other things that seem bad may actually be good. In fact, problems may bring hidden blessings. You're challenged in life. You're going through a trial. We just sang about it. You're going through difficulties. There can be hidden blessings in the midst of all of those. It all depends on who you're looking for. We go 
Maybe because God's in control, we're not. We can't, we can't predict all the possibilities. Problems may bring hidden blessings. So with that in mind, we go back and ask the question, what do, you, what do we think about the new year? I look at 2024, and, and since people are involved, I see great potential for more problems. <laughs> That's just the way it is. It seems to me that if you look at history, history uh, uh, of the human um, race is, has fairly consistent track record for messing things up. Ever since Adam and Eve in the garden, it seems that people have created more problems than they've solved. We have good intentions, but we also have big issues. We're dysfunctional, we can't get along, we see the world in terms of us versus them, we're selfish, we struggle with greed, we want control, we want power, we fight to get our own way, the list goes on and on. The world's pretty messed up. The world needs help, a lot of help. Doesn't need a new invention, for example. Doesn't need a shrink or a therapist. The world needs a savior. The world needs a savior. You know, I, I received an intriguing Christmas gift. It was called Only Hope Soap. <laughs> and I looked at it, Only Hope Soap. And uh, at first, the picture on it, I thought, oh, that's Jesus. <laughs> he's, he's marketing soap now. But I looked a little more closely, and I see the words that say Star Wars, so I'm guessing that's Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm not sure. And on the back, it says this. Cleanse yourself with this soothing blend of thyme, leaf, and bentonite clay that will guide you to truly clean skin and refresh your soul. <laughs> guide you and refresh your soul. You know, the world doesn't need a new soap. It needs a savior. The world doesn't need to be saved from its... The world really needs to be saved from itself. It doesn't mean we suds down with, with only hope soap. Soap is for dirt, not sin. So many people does, will not admit that the world needs a savior. Uh, they look for other solutions. They don't want to give themselves over to God's solution. They don't want to surrender their lives to let somebody else be in control. So they try to manage things on their own and look for man-made solutions like, oh, I know, there's a lot of stuff that are good things uh, by and large. Ma uh, man-made solutions like psychology or education or science or technology or like we talked before, a political savior. And even though you can find some good in those things, Human solutions can only go so far. Am I right? They do something good, but they don't solve all the issues. Because, and, and I have to tell you, human beings are, are great. They love to dream up new ideas. Let's build a new city for ourselves, we say. Let's, let's build a tower that reaches to the sky so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. So what happened? God said, enough, these people have gone too far. Let's confuse their language so they won't understand each other. And Genesis 11 tells us that they were scattered all over the world. The very thing that they wanted not to happen, happened. And humans have a history of doing that, producing unintended consequences that mess things up. We get kicked out of the garden, we get scattered all over the earth, we become confused and don't understand each other, we take matters into our own hands instead of, instead of waiting for God to show up. We want to move the Ark of the Covenants, but we use an ox cart to try to do it. We honor God with our lips while our hearts are far from Him. We base our worship on human rules, traditions. We depend on our own thinking instead of trusting in the Lord. This is a problem. This is human nature. And that's why the Bible continually reminds us through stories and through examples and through teachings that we should follow God's ways instead of our own way. Proverbs 3, very familiar to, I think, everyone in the room, basically. 
It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. And that's good advice for the new year. Good advice for any year, at any time, right? Good News Translation says, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never rely on what you think you know. Remember the Lord in everything you do, and he will show you the right way. So as we entered the uncharted territory of 2024, we need straight paths and right ways. That's true for the world. It's true for us as individuals. It's true for believers. It's true for a church. Google Maps isn't going to help us navigate 2024. So how do we know which way to go? What can we do? You know, after Moses died, God told Joshua, you know, I want you to lead the people into the land that I'm giving them. Uh, just as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. So be strong. Be courageous. Don't be afraid. Follow my law. It's all going to work out. You will have success wherever you go. And I'm going to, that's chapter 1 of Joshua. I'm going to pick up the story in chapter 3. Uh, beginning at verse 1. A little smaller, so you might want to open up your Bible in case you can't read that. Verse 1 of Joshua 3. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. And Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Now, I'm going to highlight four phrases in this passage. If you notice those phrases, and remember, these instructions came just before they were crossing into the Promised Land. They were right at the border, on the brink of this new adventure, going into the Promised Land, starting something new. Kind of like what we do at this time of the year when we think of what's going to happen in the next year. We're starting something new, new adventures, new possibilities. Forty Years before, their parents, the previous generation, had also stood at the border of the Promised Land. But they were paralyzed with fear, consumed them. They had fear of the unknown, what they could not see across the border. Here where they were at the border, about to cross into, about to, to go into this new adventure, and they couldn't do it. They were unable to do it because, as they said, there were giants in the land, strong, powerful giants. There were large cities with enormous, impenetrable walls that uh, they couldn't stand against. They, they were afraid because the land devours its inhabitants, whatever that means. Um, so what, what did God do with his people? Did he drag them into the land, kicking and screaming the whole way? Drag them into the promised land? You know, sometimes I'm, I'm standing in line at a store and, uh, and I see exasperated parents trying to reason with their kids. You know, right there at the register. No, we're not going to buy that toy. You've got too many toys. No, put that candy bar down. We're not going to take that candy bar. We don't need it. You know, reasoning with small children is, is not easy. And, and sometimes in the store there, I've seen tantrums kicking and screaming, and that's just the parents. I mean, it's not pretty. And I just smile and congratulate myself that the small children in my life now are grandchildren. And when they're with me, I can let them have whatever they want to have. <laughs> let me tell you, God is not our grandfather. So he allowed the people to suffer the consequences of their own decision. 
He didn't force them into the land against their will. So they spent the next 40 years wandering through the wilderness. What was it that kept them out of the land? Was it the giants? No. Was it the walled cities? No. It was their own fears, their distorted perspectives. They were unable to enter the land because of their poor attitudes, because of their lack of faith, because of their bad choices. It wasn't the giants that chased them into the wilderness. They went into the wilderness by choice. And I think that's pretty critical for us to remember, that we have choices. No matter what the year brings, we will always have choices. How we respond to it, what we're going to do in reaction to the situations that we face. And maybe as you look back over your life, you can say, yeah, I've, I've faced a few giants along the way. I've, I've faced the giants of fear or of the giant of discouragement. Or, or maybe you face the giant of, of broken dreams or the giant of addictions, the giant of consequences of bad choices like Deb was sharing with us just a, a moment ago. The consequences. Or maybe if it's not giants, maybe it's a desert. Maybe you look back and you feel like 2023 was a pretty dry time for you. I don't know. You know, the wilderness is not just a, a dry desert place. You know you've been in a wilderness if you've been beaten down and bruised by life and things aren't working. It, it, it's frustrating, you know, when your prayers bounce off the ceiling or feel like they are. You know you're in a wilderness. And if you've been waiting and waiting and waiting to see God's promises fulfilled, you know what it means to be thirsting for God in the wilderness. A lot of us have gone through wilderness times. But the promised land is on the other side. And that's the hope that I want to just share with you today. Because this story uh, from Joshua chapter 3 is not just about Joshua and the Israelites. It's about us. It's our story. It's not just about being on the border of the promised land. It's about us being on the brink of something good that God wants to do in our lives. Something new that God wants to do. So no matter where you've been, no matter what you've experienced in the past, the lows and the highs, the failures and the successes, whatever your setbacks, whatever your accomplishments, God has more for you. God has a plan for you. God wants to take you into this year, 2024, full of faith, full of anticipation. That's what God has a desire. Now, you might go through some tough times. You might experience some more setbacks, some more giants. But what do you do with those giants? Recognize that the first generation ran away the other direction. This generation went in and faced the giants. We have a choice. Of course, I have to warn you, the, the promised land is no walk in the park. <laughs> it's receiving God's promises in 2024. It means that we're going to have to face some giants. Blessings often come after the battles that we go through. You'll need to stomp down your fears if you want to walk by faith. And if you want to live a victorious life, you're going to have to fight the good fight. You can't have a victory without a fight. So these instructions that Joshua uh, passed along to the people for entering this land that was filled with giants and walled cities, these instructions are good for us as well as we enter the unknown days of 2024. And I would just want to encourage you with that, that there's something in these pas this passage right here that we can learn. So the, the first thing is this. If we want to be God's people in these uncertain times, there are Four things, they were highlighted on the previous slide. Four things that we need to get a hold of and we need to implement into our lives. The first one is this. Keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open. Be on the lookout. Because the scripture says when you see the ark coming, and we know the ark was just really the focal point of God's presence. When you see the ark coming, we've got to keep our eyes open if we're going to see the ark coming. If you're going to see God's presence, what he is up to, what he is doing, where he is, you've got to keep your eyes open. Look and see where, where God is on the move. Keep your, your hearts open to what God is doing. Be open to the move of his spirit. You know, how often 
I look back and say, how often did I miss what God was doing? You know, God's, how, how often did I miss God's best for me? Because I, I didn't see what he was up to. You know, I was so preoccupied or too busy to notice or too tired to pay attention. Just all stuff going on in regular life. And, and God kept moving. And I, I missed him. And maybe you've missed him at times too, where God wanted to do something and he just didn't see what he was up to. God, help us, help us to keep our eyes open and see what you're up to. Keep your eyes open. The second thing is to be ready. Be ready to move. Scripture says, move out from your positions and follow. Listen, when God's on the move, it's time for us to move. Be ready. Follow the ark. Follow God's presence. Get involved with what God is doing. Look around to see what he's doing and then plug in. As you move um, with God, there are three things about being ready that I just want to highlight. Three things, subpoints of this, be ready to move. The first one is don't get ahead of God. Don't get ahead of him. Moses prayed in Exodus 33, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't send us up from here. That should be our attitude. We're not doing anything if we don't have God's presence in us and motivating us and empowering us. Proverbs says, it's not good to have zeal without knowledge, nor to be hasty and miss the way. Sometimes people get so zealous and so excited that they get hasty and they miss the way. I remember one of the, one of the old saints that I, I first met when I went into the ministry a long time ago. Now I'm one of the old saints, but back then I was a young saint. And I met one of the old saints, and maybe some of you old-timers might remember Olaf Bakken. Anybody here remember that name? Yeah? So uh, he pastored for many years in Michigan, and then, then he was in Foston when I first met him. And uh, he had a son. And any of you remember uh, Paul Bakken, his son? A Down syndrome young guy. And he was a joy to everyone around. They just loved Loved Paul, and, and one time Olaf was telling me about the time that Paul um, there, I think it was in Faustin, I'm, I can't be sure, but he, uh, they, it was like a 4th of July parade or something like that, and they had all the floats out there, and they had the people, do the dance team and everything, they, they had the marching band going down Main Street, and Paul got so excited that he got out in front of the, the very first thing in the parade, so now, going down Main Street, there is Paul marching ahead of everybody else. And he's so excited. There's crowds on both sides. They're all cheering, you know, and clapping. And he's just going along like this. But what Paul didn't realize was at the end of the Main Street section, the, <laughs> the parade took a right turn. And he didn't know that. So he just kept marching straight down the road and the crowds thinned out there weren't people standing there no one was cheering and he turns around to see what's going on and sees the the band and everybody turning right at the back corner and he stood in the middle of the street and he says come on come on i think we're like that sometimes we just we get so excited about doing things that we get ahead of god we we Go too fast. We're so zealous that we are hasty and we miss the way. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but where you try to make something happen because you can't wait for God to help you do it. So that's the first thing. Don't get ahead of him. The second thing is this. When he moves, don't delay in following him. Don't just sit there going nowhere when you could be moving. I'm not talking about getting ahead. I'm just saying... Be on, on time, right? Um, don't sing, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, if you can't take the first step when you should take it. Some say, I can't teach a Sunday school class because I'm going to be a missionary evangelist in Africa. I don't have time to teach Sunday school. I'm waiting for the big event. Don't delay. Do what you can as soon as you can. The third thing is keep it real. When God moves, keep it real. Follow, but not too closely. It says don't, don't get any closer than 2,000 cubits. I wonder why those instructions were there. 
And I don't, you know, we can speculate, we can surmise what it might mean, but, but at least, uh, and I've probably changed my opinions on it several times, I know, but to me it, it says we should follow him, but not too closely. We should follow him, but, but not presumptuously. You know, follow, but don't think that you've got it all together. Don't think that you know everything what to expect or where to turn. Don't, don't go down that way. Don't pretend that you can lean on your own understanding instead of trusting in the Lord with all your heart. Follow, but keep it real. Be honest. Though. And that leads us to the, another characteristic in this whole sequence. For God's a characteristic that we need in uncertain times, and that is to be humble. Be humble. You might as well confess it. What it says there, you've never been this way before. Anybody ever gone through 2024? No, we haven't. We can guess what might happen, but we don't know. There probably will be some ups and some downs, uh, some laughter, some tears, joys, sorrows. We, we just don't know, not really. We've never been this way before, so how could we know? In fact, we should learn as we go. And we don't learn everything all at once. It's not like God delivers us a, a list of things that's happening. You know, I just, this was just sitting up here. It's on, on the podium. It tells us what's happening in this service. God doesn't give us a list of what's happening in 2024. We don't know. We learn as we go. If we're humble enough to stay open to be led by the Spirit and listen to the Spirit. In, in other words, when, when it says, Keep your eyes open. That's not just to know when to move, when you're ready, but it also means to follow. We've got to continually keep our eyes open, continually look for the presence of God, continually watch for the move of the Spirit of the Lord. Since we've never been this way before, we need to be humble enough to admit that we don't know everything. And we should be lifelong learners. What can we learn in 2024? And the fourth thing is this. Commit yourself to God's purposes. There in verse 5, Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves. King James Version says, Sanctify yourselves. New Living Translation says, Purify yourselves. The, the Hebrew is kadash, which literally meant to be set apart. Now, the word was used in, you look it up in the Old Testament, a lot of, when they, when they set boundaries around the holy mountain, you know, don't get any closer to the mountain than this, it's set apart. It was used to reserve the Sabbath day for, for God alone. Kadash was used to describe the priestly garments. Uh, it was used for, for what they wore in worship. They didn't wear it any other time. It was reserved for God alone, for worshiping. Even, even the what, silk or satin underwear or whatever it was. It was used to describe the tabernacle, to the, describe the altar. Kadash was used for anything and anyone set apart from everyday functions and ordinary routine, anyone that was reserved exclusively for God's special purposes. So to consecrate yourself then, to commit yourself, means to give yourself to God, to set yourself apart for God's purposes. And here's the promise that comes when we keep our eyes open when we stay ready, when we are humble and remain humble, and when we commit ourselves to God's purposes, the promise is this. The Lord will do amazing things among you. Amazing things. Say that with me. Amazing things. I don't know about you, but I really trust that God will do amazing things in my life this year. Don't you? Miraculous things. Powerful works. I want to see God do things that are unexpected, things that I could never have anticipated, things that I can't even dream of. I want God to do more than what human power can do or what human thinking can do or what positive thinking can do. I want God to do things that are way beyond what I would expect in my own strength. Lord, I just pray today that we would open our hearts to what you're doing. 
we stand at the border of a new season of life. We stand here entering into this new year with all of its uncertainty and all of the stuff going on in the world and all of the uh, disappointments and the, the animosity and the, the back and forth that's in our society today. We stand here, God, facing all kinds of things that we don't know or understand. We're like those people in Genesis who didn't, weren't able to communicate with one another and they got confused and they didn't understand and they were scattered around. It seems like there's a scattering in this world today. But Lord, as we stand entering into this new land, I pray that we would be people who would, would give ourselves to what you desire to do. That we would, we would watch for what you're doing. We'd see the ark when it moves. We would be ready to move when it moves. We would be humble enough to open ourselves up to the things that we don't understand and allow you to do things in, in our lives. That we would consecrate ourselves. We would set ourselves aside for this purpose, for this time. And let me just ask you all, while, as we continue to pray, would you stand with me? Would you just stand? Here we are. We can be an army for God. We can take the promised land. But Lord, I pray that you would help each of us in our own uh, situation and in our own way to answer that question, are we willing? Will we face those giants? Will we take on those walled cities? Will we give ourselves over to following you no matter what? Lord, I, I pray that as we, as we enter into your plan for our lives, that we would allow you to have full and complete control. We surrender ourselves to you. And God, we thank you for what you have done. Already, and we anticipate that you're going to do stuff that we don't, can't even imagine. So, James, would you come? And we're going to close the service in prayer. But even as we close, I know that for most of you, this is an individual decision. This is something that you have to do on your own. And, uh, and so you can do it at the altar. You can do it in your bedroom at home. You can do it where, in, in your car. Uh, on the way to work or something like that. It doesn't matter where. Just make sure that you've committed yourself to the Lord, that you're going to follow that presence of God into this new year. You're going to be responsive to Him. And if it helps and you would like to do it right here, right now, that's good. That's good. And I, I, I'm sure the elders would be happy to pray with you. Pastor Felix and others. Sylvia. So, Lord, we give ourselves to you and just help this word to take root in our lives and in our hearts that we would be responsive to what you desire to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Other things. So, once again, Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your word that has just come forth to teach us how to go through the year not only through this year, but years ahead, or how to live in life. Help us to have our focus on you, O oh God. Help us, O oh God, to be humble and uh, be ready whenever you are calling us, O oh God, or directing us, O oh God. Help us to keep things real, O oh God, even as you lead us, O oh God. Help us to be submitted completely to the Holy Spirit and to your word. Lord, be glorified. Thank you, O Lord, that you have promised that even as we obey in your leading, O God, you make all things good. And we are so grateful to you, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, let's receive the benediction as I read from this passage, Roman, uh, number six. It says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. And be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Even as you go through the, the rest of the week and the days ahead, may he strengthen you. May he empower you. May he lead you and grant you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.